Hello. Uh, we're going to get started in just a minute here. If you could grab your seats for the first session. Thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome to our first Carnegie Mellon Open Science Symposium. Um, on behalf of the organizers, uh, myself, Anna, Melanie, Fajin, and Eric, we're really excited to have you here today. Um, I want to make just a couple of logistics announcements. Uh, the first is that the Wi-Fi code for, uh, in, printed on the back of your program, for those of you outside of CMU, is incorrect. Please. <laughs> Despite, despite my best efforts. Um, and now, and now this is a secret too. I took a picture of it, let me read it. Sure, well, actually I have it here. R, D, Y, T, Z, 2, 3, V. It's coming back. All right, there we are. Take a picture of that Wi-Fi code. Uh, there should be Edgerome as well. Oh, we're having a lot of technical difficulties. We'll just leave it like that. Okay, that was announcement one, Wi-Fi code. Can someone check? Maybe it's the cable. Okay. The second announcement is about the location of the restrooms, um, which are not immediately nearby. Um, however, there are restrooms on both this floor, the fourth floor, as well as on the third floor. You exit the library the way you came in. There are directions uh, to both of them. You can take stairs or elevator uh, down to three as well. Um, ask us at the break if you have trouble. And um, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our introductory speaker, Rebecca Dirge, our Dean of Mellon College of Science. Here's your lab, now wait a year and a half for the renovation. 
Um, those are gone, that we'll be using centralized labs run by professionals who uh, help us get the best possible data. Uh, and then what we do with that data forward and how we share that data is one of the topics that uh, I know that you're invited to speak about today. Um, so today and tomorrow, you'll have a chance to uh, participate in workshops that cover pipeline development, data sharing, reproducibility of um, data publication results and things like that. I should probably have a disclaimer. I'm a statistician by training. Um, so when I hear reproducibility, you know, a little light goes off. And when I hear sample size, another little light goes off. Um, I'm uh, trained as a mathematician turned statistician, started in human genetics probably before all of you were born, and then switched to agricultural genomics. So uh, my research group chases technology and, and figures out ways to analyze the data because no one ever worries about experimental de design or how to analyze the data. Uh, these companies just make really cool technology that generates more and more data and uh, we have to figure out what to do with it, how to share it, how to share the results, how to combine the results, and things like that. Um, so tonight, I understand that there will be uh, speed dating. Yeah. Is that right? Where is Eric? Speed dating. Yeah, speed dating, which I'm actually, uh, I, I think that this is really how to do things, and I encourage you all to participate in it. And, and the students in the room, you have to learn how to message your science in three minutes or less so that people can understand it. So really, if you're not participating, which I, I actually encourage the, the, the students and the postdocs and the young people to participate, if you're not participating, just really pay attention to how important this is. Because you usually only get three minutes of attention. You guys, the one thing you're gonna remember from today from me, my car broke down. That was the first uh, 30 seconds. Everything else, you're just you're already off the mala land. It's the human brain. Um, so um, let's see. So before we start, I need to thank lots of people. So the David Scaife uh, Charitable Foundation. Uh, I actually took a picture of this, and I know the, the guy who runs the foundation. And I text him these pictures of these conferences and say thank you. You're changing. You're changing science and how it how we're moving forward. I also want to thank Figshare, um, Code Ocean, CMLH. Uh, Protocols.io, BenchSci, and of course uh, the Carnegie Mellon University Libraries. We have Keith Webster here, who is the, the Dean of Libraries. We're very grateful um, for Keith's forward thinking ideas about libraries. Uh, he is a computer scientist by training, and he's the only librarian I've met who doesn't really like books. Um, <laughs> so. We spend a lot of time together, and uh, I encourage you all to, to meet Keith, because he's not your average librarian. Um, I also want to thank our conference organizers. Uh, Anna was here before. Anna van uh, Blue Gulik. Anna van Gulik, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Juan Jin Huang, uh, Melanie Ganey, um, and the from the CMU libraries. Eric Gitry, who from Biological Sciences, is who um, has been here less than two years, but has had a significant impact. I want to thank you all, your young people. You're leading the future of science at Carnegie Mellon. Um, everyone else, please network, make friends. If you need anything, yell at one of the organizers or me. Um, I'm around all day. I'm going to try really hard to be here tonight, so I'm crashing the conference because I'm super interested. Um, just let's turn this into a discussion where we can all meet each other and learn about these new things because this is your future for sure. So enjoy yourself. Have fun.
Uh, a few minutes for questions, especially any clarification questions that you might have so that you don't forget them uh, before we move on to the next talk. Um, our sessions uh, should have enough room to accommodate that. Uh, and then we'll have, after all of the speakers' talks, we'll have them all come up to these bar stools and uh, pretend we're at a pub in the morning here. And uh, then we'll have some time for a Q&A. And, &A. and uh, I can help moderate that. But we also really want to hear from you guys. Um, so be thinking about what questions uh, you might want all of these people uh, to take a stab at. Um, and uh, we'll let them uh, chat it out. So first, I'd like to present uh, our first speaker, uh, who is Josh Siegel, uh, who is a scientist at the Allen Institute in Seattle. Josh. So there are many different aspects to open science, and as an employee of the Allen Institute, which is a um, institute that's very dedicated to many different um, approaches to open science, there are a number of different things I could have talked about, but today I'm going to talk about what I think is the importance of open source tools for doing science. Um, so when I was a graduate student at MIT, I helped develop an open source platform for extracellular electrophysiology. So these are experiments in which you are inserting dozens or even hundreds of electrodes into brains, and you need to extract the signals from those electrodes and filter them, digitize them, and send them to a computer for processing and visualization. And uh, when I was a graduate student, there were not very many options for open source uh, versions of this type of experimental hardware, and the, uh, the things that did exist were not well documented and not easy to reproduce. And so uh, I worked along with another graduate student, Jacob Boats, on creating a system that was, uh, first of all, suitable for the types of experiments that I wanted to do, but also uh, had the potential to share it um, with many other people. So from the beginning, we did all of our development out in the open, um, sharing all of our code and designs and uh, documentation through GitHub. And so all, all of the tools you see here, um, the designs are, are freely available. And doing this out in the open and presenting at conferences and stuff helped us find collaborators and rally people around the cause. Um, and there was a lot of enthusiasm for this at this point in time, uh, because a lot of people felt that the existing commercial hardware for doing these types of experiments was just too expensive for what uh, for the features you were getting. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I didn't have the flexibility to uh, do the types of groundbreaking experiments that scientists really wanted to do. So OpenEFIS caught on. Uh, these tools are now being used at over 140 institutions in 30 different countries. Um, I think it appeals both to scientists who um, really want the ability to hack their own hardware and um, do things that just no one has thought of before um, and are only possible if you have access to the, the low level details of the hardware and software that you're working with. But it also appeals to scientists who may not have the funds to afford some of the more expensive commercial hardware. Uh, these are either scientists in labs that don't specialize in electrophysiology, so um, they don't have funding set aside for buying these um, large commercial systems, or there are labs in, in places that don't have that much funding for science in general, and this is the only way that they can do these types of experiments. Uh, another impressive thing, I think, is that uh, our software for data acquisition has been forked almost 350 times on GitHub, so that means people are copying the source code with the intent of making their own modifications and then hopefully sharing those modifications back with the rest of the community. And so uh, it's really become a nice community development effort. Um, and now like, a, a lot of the support questions that come in are just handled by people around the world, um, not necessarily handled by the people who originally developed the, the hardware and software, which is really cool. So I think the three main reasons why we put in the effort to develop these open tools were affordability, flexibility, and reproducibility. And I want to touch on reproducibility because I think um, that is hopefully something that 
um, will be brought up a, a lot during the symposium. Um, so during the course of a scientific experiment, uh, in this case, um, recording electrical signals from the brain of a mouse, um, you typically um, want to treat your data acquisition hardware as sort of agnostic to um, the system under investigation. Um, you kind of assume that you have this experimental subject that you want to record data from, um, but it shouldn't matter what specific uh, type of computer you're using or what data format you're using. Um, what really matters is the uh, results that you get and how you um, how you make those public through your, your publications. Uh, but there are other types of experiments where um, the experimental hardware becomes part of the system under investigation, and these are, are closed loop experiments. Uh, these were the type of experiments that we really wanted to do and which were difficult to implement with a lot of the commercial hardware just because they require so much flexibility. And in this case, um, whatever algorithms you use, whatever uh, hardware you use to actually um, stimulate the system, so you, you take some measurement from the brain and then use that to trigger feedback to the brain, which is a really powerful <coughs> way to study the system because you can do types of interventions that would be impossible otherwise. But here, if anyone wants to reproduce what you've done, they need to use the exact same, um, not necessarily the exact same hardware, but they have to use the, the same algorithms and um, very similar setup because everything is so tightly integrated. And so with Open EFIS, um, we were able to create plugins for the software that did all this closed loop processing, and those were super easy to share with anyone else who used the system. Um, and I think as closed loop experiments become more commonplace in neuroscience, which I hope they will be because they're really powerful, uh, we need common interfaces to be able to share the, um, the algorithms that we use for these types of manipulations. And um, having an open source framework for that makes it a lot easier. So from the beginning, oh, the Open EFIS software was designed to be as modular as possible. So um, people could add their own data sources or filters or closed loop processing algorithms or visualizations. And um, then once those were built once by, by one person, they could be shared with the rest of the community. And so we could reduce the, the need for redundant development efforts. Um, the specific plugin that I worked on when I was in graduate school was one that could detect the theta oscillation in, in hippocampus. So this is a brain rhythm that's associated with learning and memory and um, trigger stimulation at specific phases of theta uh, because there were hypotheses that you have different phases of this rhythm that are involved in encoding and different phases that are involved in retrieval. And without the ability to stimulate the hippocampus at specific phases of data, we never could have addressed these questions. And so we were able to show that we could improve mouse's performance on a working memory task just by stimulating the hippocampus at specific phases of data. Um, and now other people are using the plugin I developed to do similar experiments around the world. Our current focus at the Allen Institute um, in terms of using Open EFIS is to adapt it for use with a new type of uh, experimental hardware called NeuroPixels probes. So these are high density silicon probes with uh, almost a thousand channels on them and we stick five or six of them in, in the brain at, at a time. And so it's this uh, huge influx of data that we have to deal with in real time in order to, we need to be able to visualize it in order to know that our electrodes are in the, are in the right place need to save it all to disk so we can analyze it offline. And so this has been a big challenge to be able to handle all this data in real time. Um, but Open, Open EFIS has been great for this. And um, we can now do experiments like this one where you see almost a, spikes from almost a thousand neurons recorded simultaneously across uh, different regions of mouse cortex. Um, so with the current hardware, we can interface uh, actually up to 16 neuropixels probes with one computer. And then we've developed um, new visualizations that allow you to see the activity across all the different layers that you're recording from. Uh, this particular recording had electrodes in cortex, hippocampus, and thalamus. And these types of experiments are gonna allow us to answer questions about interactions between 
different parts of the brain that would have been really hard to address before. So before I wrap up, uh, I just want to talk about some of the lessons that we've learned in the course of building this community around open source tools. Uh, open Ethos has been around for around eight years, um, and we've grown from just a, a single lab to uh, over 140 labs around the world. And so I think some of the, the things that are worth mentioning is that, first of all, open source on its own is not enough to facilitate community development. Uh, you really need to think carefully about how um, the, the ways in which people will be able to modify your tools and um, sort of give them nice interfaces to um, add their own functionality. Um, it's really just, I mean, it, it's, it's super important to share anything that you do for science, but if you really want to make sure that um, you can build a community around it and people will contribute back, it needs to be really obvious how they're supposed to modify the things that you've built. Um, and so along those lines, I think having well-designed open interfaces is more important than being fully open source. Um, I think there's, there's some cases in which um, it, you, you, it is important to have closed source tools in order to be able to protect intellectual contributions. Um, so, so some examples of these are the internships. These are these uh, tiny integrated circuits that we use for um, data acquisition in the in open EFIS. Um, and the chips themselves are, are closed source, but they have really nice open interfaces for getting data off of them that allowed us to um, build this open source ecosystem around them. And the neural process probes, which I just talked about, are themselves closed source, but they have uh, really nice interfaces for getting data off of it. And so I think getting neuroscientists to agree on open interface standards is really difficult, but I think it's it's really important for moving the field forward to uh, be able to have these, these shared interfaces, um, both on the hardware side and on the, the software side. Uh, and finally, um, I wanna say that Maintaining features is even more valuable than building them. Um, it's really easy to say, oh, I'm gonna add this cool feature on the weekend, but if you're not really dedicated to making sure that it stays up to date when other parts of the software change or it breaks down in some condition that you hadn't anticipated before, um, I think it will, it's very easy to fall by the wayside. So I think making sure that you have people that are dedicated to maintaining all the features that you add to your open source project is, is really, really crucial. So I um, just want to thank some of the people who contributed to this. Uh, Jacob Boats, um, it wouldn't have been possible without him. Um, we have a support person in, in Spain, uh, Aron, who uh, has been doing great work. Um, Open Youth as board of directors. Uh, we have people in, in Lisbon who are handling all of our hardware distribution, which has been really great. And then uh, this fraction of the, the people who have contributed code back to uh, the Open Ethos software and um, help make sure that the community continues to grow. I knew that the low-cost hardware 
for many people would be the most appealing thing uh, aspect of this, but um, also that hardware becomes obsolete quickly and we're in a period in which there's big, rapid technical advancement. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that we had software that was agnostic to where the data was coming from. And so um, this was actually built on top of a library for processing audio data because audio is very similar to electrophysiology data in terms of its sample rate and bit depth. And a lot of features of the audio processing library made it really ideal for processing neural data. And so without that, this would have been really difficult to implement, but because we had um, this audio processing infrastructure already, it was pretty simple to build this on top of that. interns for the summer, which are funded by Google, and um, both of the students that we mentored made really great progress during the summer, and then never quite finished what they were working on, and then once they, the internship finished, um, they left and became more or less unreachable, and so we've had to very slowly like try to pick up the pieces and um, fix what they've done, but the, the features that they implemented never became fully fully functional. So it really just like having people that are dedicated to um, making sure that the um, yeah, features remain functional after they've been built is really important. All right, thanks a lot. I'd like to introduce our second speaker for this session, uh, Vaughn Cooper, who's an associate professor of microbiology and molecular genetics at the University of Pittsburgh. Vaughn. So I, I think I'm really uh, thrilled for a chance to, to share uh, my passion for preprinting in uh, the life sciences with you. So I'm just across the, well, sort of across the street, you'll see. Um, in the School of Medicine at Pitt. Um, and uh, I'm here as an ambassador for a movement or a foundation, a program called ASAP Bio that is directed by Jessica Polka, who I believe was originally invited to come here and she graciously said, you have an ambassador across the street. Why don't you give him a chance to, to sort of shop our wares? And that's what I'm, I'm here to do. I also uh, co-founded and direct a new center launching tomorrow for evolutionary biology and medicine. Um, these are two very different cultures, one being more uh, early embracing of open science, the other not, and I stand at the, at the juncture. So just a quick introduction, I came here three years ago after spending 12 years on the faculty at the University of New Hampshire, which is a relatively underfunded state institution. Our libraries were, were certainly under-resourced, you know, no taxes in the state means no, no very few books. And, and so we were really keen for access to journals and we were, as a, as a teacher who was often prescribing, you know, you must read these articles, go find them, we were always running into paywalls that were slowing our progress. And so I, I hold that, that kind of angst near and dear even now that I'm here at this really wealthy institution and well-resourced institution, uh, the School of Medicine at Pitt. I'm actually down by the river on, on 2nd Avenue in one of those biotech buildings in case you want to come visit. So anyway, these are two different research environments in terms of their mission and their resources. One is really a, a, a teacher-scholar model and the other is we want to advance academic medicine across the board. Um, and so um, I think uh, along with our angst, it became really clear as a community that the traditional way of sharing science is really slow. And so the need to get uh, access to journals 
and the, and the, and the need to learn about uh, resources, learn about findings sooner are, are sort of one in the same. That is, you know, when you are, when you are not at a, uh, a wealthy place, or simply if you're time limited, you can't go around and hear talks at conferences all around the world. And so they come to you late, often a year past the paywall um, uh, gets dropped, uh, if at all. And so you know, there's a very long process where the best work goes through, and even not the best work, goes through peer review and cycles revision and rejection and so on. And only uh, after some period of time does community feedback and ideas and data sharing come around. So the, the notion that we should uh, post our data, uh, our results, ahead of, uh, ahead of publication is not new. Archive has been doing it in physics and, and mathematics and other sciences for more than 20 years, but it is relatively new for the life sciences. And so BioArchive is our primary resource, but it is not the only one. Um, so preprints are, are where you, you post your results ahead of, well, at some point. Some people post it right when they submit first to publication. Others, like us, submit it when we're getting ready to submit for publication. And that's been incredibly valuable because we've been getting feedback from authors, uh, reviewers, potential reviewers, and even engaging them. Say, hey, thanks for your comments. Would you be willing to be a, a, serve as a reviewer if I mention this to the, to the editor when we submit? It goes to a, 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 a actually a, a reasonably rigorous screening before it gets posted. Not everything makes it as a preprint. And then it's open. And then combined with social media, your research is immediately available. And so this, this uh, process of community discussion and feedback and idea sharing can be immediate. And um, I'm really active on Twitter. Many people who use preprints are also active on Twitter. And we see these dialogues happening in real time. And they've been shaping the way we've been doing our science. So just for the record, preprints are permanent. They are versioned, they are citable, they are open to the public and free. And so they, they meet some really key demands that we had had coming out of this, as I say, sort of this under-resourced environment. And again, you're not at one. Many of you are, are not. But think about who you want to read, read your, research, your, your research and how quickly you want, to, want, want them to have access to it. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm an a ASAP bio ambassador, and I basically became an ambassador by saying, hey, I really like preprints, I like your mission, what can I do to help? And, and uh, they've been very generous in, in sharing their materials. In fact, most of these slides come from uh, a, a, an open drive that I get from, from, uh, from the organization. So it's biologist-driven, nonprofit organization working to make life science communication faster and more transparent. It is not exclusively about bioarchive, although that association between that place for preprint, that sort of site for preprinting and ASP bio is, is fairly common. So I just want to go through some concerns about preprinting, because they are many. Um, really, they are three, but they are big. And the first is, I'm afraid that by posting my research ahead of being formally published, I'm going to get scooped. And, and as the founder of Archive has said, and has, and has many fields have adopted, you can't, that can't happen because Archive provides a, a time-stamped a time or date-stamped uh, sort of statement of priority. And it is up to you, the scientific community, to review whether that statement is uh, worthy of being accepted as a major fund. Uh, the second is that it's a, against journal policy, and the great news is this is, ha this is changing really quickly. Um, so there's an enormous list of, of big journals. This is just a tiny subset of, of sort of name brand journals that accept articles that uh, already are, are appearing on a preprint server. And that list uh, is easily accessible at Wikipedia and at the, the, uh, um, the Sherpa site, which talks about uh, publication policy. And then the final thing is that, oh, well, maybe there's just too much information. How do I know whether my preprint is, is worth reading? I'm going to see it later in a journal. I'm going to see it in my society journal. But I mean, let's be honest. We typically see about see the major findings in our research at massive post sessions anyway, or even sessions like this. You're getting new, new findings and research here in advance of print. So work, sharing our work before peer review is common practice. In fact, it's sort of the first phase of peer review, isn't it not? 
So preprint use is really increasing greatly uh, in the life sciences. I will say not with my new collaborators here at the School of Medicine in Pittsburgh. So we have a long way to go. So I will say, if you take a look at all the papers that we've been, my lab has been uh, affiliated with over the last three years, only about a, a quarter of them have actually been preprinting. Because, you know, frankly, my colleagues in infectious diseases don't know anything about it, and those are big barriers to overcome. So even though I've said, you know, this is, we can get through this, it's not a big deal. Eh, it's, it, there's a big cultural shift ahead. These numbers help, and I think uh, there's sort of a crowd mentality that started to percolate, particularly among, uh, called the under 45 generation. <laughs> I'm just past that. Um, so j just to give you a sense, you know, these numbers really are exploding, and so most of that growth in life science is in that green, trade, uh, green group bioarchive. Another great um, emotive for preprinting, which we see a lot, again, in these in sort of new faculty who are trying to hustle and get their first grants, is that funders are encouraging us to, to preprint our work as a record of progress. So it's not Cooper at all in prep, it's, it's Cooper at all bioarchive. Here's your citation, go take a look. Um, so what are some benefits? You can gain visibility combined with uh, just simply distribution from the servers. They all ha often have Twitter handles that are specific to, to disciplines. Some of them have blogs. You can, you can move your data around, sort of advocate for your science yourself. You can get feedback to improve your paper. That's happened to us many times, often starting with a direct message on Twitter. Hey, I read that. I think this is really cool. I've got a problem here. Let me tell you about it. And I, I thought about showing, trying to dig up those direct messages, but I, I don't want to bore you. Um, you can find, and often interest, there are journal editors that are now scouring the archive servers looking for good material for their journals. And, and uh, some of the major journals that are listed on there have a, have a person dedicated to that role. That's really pretty exciting. You can find collaborators earlier. I know not, this hasn't, we haven't quite gotten to this point for my lab, and that's why it's not in red. All these others have helped us. Some people have found new colleagues and new, new resources through preprinting. You create this record, you demonstrate productivity for your jobs and grant proposals, you can accelerate your, your discovery, and I, I think last and, and probably most important, it's free to the taxpayer. Uh, so a lot of our work is taxpayer funded and this gets that result out right away. Another um, new and I think uh, pretty exciting set of movements that's really are still developing are these commenting venues that are, are sort of organized ways, organized communities that take a look at preprints, provide uh, sort of almost journal club level dialogue about those preprints, and then can actually submit those reviews along with the, uh, the preprint to a journal. So I'm an academic, I'm one of the associate editors of the journal Evolution, one of the biggest uh, uh, journals in my field of evolutionary biology, and we have a policy of accepting uh, these packaged uh, sort of preprints plus peer reviews from PCI evolutionary biology. It tends to streamline the submission. It's actually helping us as a journal to reduce the time from between submission and acceptance in some cases. It's also just turning us, uh, allowing us to provide immediate editorial feedback. As an associate editor, I can say, this is not gonna make it at this particular bar, but I'm gonna refer you to a, to a, to a secondary journal. <coughs> Um, and so if you're interested more, there's also another great 10 simple rules in, uh, this is in uh, PLOS Computational Biology about preprinting, which is outstanding. So I was just mentioning about uh, high visibility. Here's an example of BioArchive, bio the Twitter channel for evolutionary biology. For microbiology, note it's got a decent number of followers. And uh, there are folks, journalists, who are, are watching these, these channels. And here's a really great recent example of a, a story that appeared in the New York Times citing the BioArchive article in advance of that actually coming out in science down the road about how, uh, how sort of the physiology and, and biochemistry of a beetle was providing broad insight into evolutionary biology. So I just want to give you a sense though that, that all is not a panacea. This is a real life, and I hope you can read this in the back, uh, debate in my lab. This is a Slack message, thank you between uh, two of my uh, really terrific postdocs who are both on the job market right now. Um, so I wrote, hi Chris and Caroline, so now that the article is submitted, this is Caroline's uh, major article from her postdoc, 
How do we feel about bioarchive? You know I'm in favor, but I won't move forward until unless we're unanimous, my policy. Chris, I'm in favor. Caroline, what do you see as the advantage of putting on a bioarchive? Thus far, I've put all my papers on bioarchive, and in my experience is that there are some real drawbacks. If there are any flaws that the reviewers catch, people have been reading the flawed version. Two, people pay less attention when the actual paper comes out. Three, less likely to be important. I've had difficulty where, where reporters want to write about the paper, but the journal won't let me talk to them. And then she says, if, if it gets closer to job application season, I would see the benefits out, as outweighing the disadvantages. But right now, it seems to me that the dis disadvantages outweigh the advantages. And then Chris outlined some of the advantages that I've already uh, talked about. And I'll just give you the punchline. We actually didn't preprint the article. We submitted it to an open access journal in our field, and it was accepted pretty quickly. Uh, which is great news, and so it got right out. But I want to respond to her comments now that we made that, that group decision. One, you can update your preprint. It's got version control, and you can respond to that feedback on the fly. Two, when you submit an article and actually gets published, BioArchive updates your publication link with the link to the actual peer-reviewed publication. And three, you can see, let's see prior New York Times article, this barrier is eroding pretty quickly, which is great, and that's really community driven. Um, so there are lots of resources available at ASAP Bio if you're interested. Um, as I say, I'm just an ambassador holding the flag, um, and I just want to thank you for, for giving me the time to talk about it, and, and I've been glad to, to talk to you more about pro, uh, promoting preprint awareness. Thanks again. question was that one could find potential reviewers for a paper who have, I guess, posted comment and identified themselves, and then associate editors or something can just reach out to them and say, hey, you want to be the reviewer? Right, so, so that, that, that's happened sort of in two ways. One, I've, been, I've gotten feedback directly by, say, tweeting out my recent preprint, and, and folks have said, hey, it looks interesting, and then send me a message with comments. I have an offline sort of email dialogue about, about that to clarify the comments. Talk to my authors, we update the, the paper in response, we post a new version, and then when we submit it, we say, I ask in advance, would you be willing to serve as a reviewer as I send it to the journal? Of course, that's up to the, the editors about whether they, they take that recommendation. 
that's happened a couple of times. The second, um, second model is actually uh, really a whole other exciting work that, uh, bit of work that I can't really comment on, which are, are basically journal clubs focused on preprint reviewing. And they're, they're organized at various organizations. Sometimes they're on, online, so it's at a particular school or in a particular online community. They will review the paper, and then they will provide, share that feedback with the author. The author can take that peer, that sort of pre-peer -peer review and package it with, through one of these channels, PCI Evolutionary Biology, for example, package that, say, I am sending you peer review and an article at once. And then I, as an associate editor, can take a look at that and make a decision, sort of a go-go, no-go decision right then. Yeah, so that's pretty advanced. But then within a year, you know, so less than 12 months old, I think. Yes? Uh, one potential issue you didn't mention was that of discoverability. Yeah. If you're not famous or Twitter famous, it, yeah. it is lost in the ether. Um, can you say something to that? I mean, it's nice to be famous or Twitter famous, but yeah. uh, well, if I put it on there and two people read it, it's almost as good as not. Yeah, I mean, you can say the same thing about any article, though. Um, I mean, so so I, I'm, I'm neither of those. Uh, my, you know, my age index is, is mediocre. Uh, I mean, right? So and I've been doing this for a while, and I'm sort of, you know, I, you know I'm average. But yet, our work is being found more often um, in, in my sort of anecdotal experience when I pair that with preprinting. Now, you know, there's no substitute for it. I mean, some of the stuff that didn't wind up on preprints is getting plenty of attention because it appears in shiny journals with, with really you know, well-renowned co-authors. So uh, yeah, it's, there's no panacea. It's a fair point, though. I mean, often preprints go unnoticed. And it's just out there for you to cite. And then it's just a, it's a, it's a fight of benefit. Yeah, just please. really quickly, I want sure. to point out that preprints are being indexed in Europe, PubMed Central. Yeah. Um, I don't, they're not in PubMed now, but they're, they are getting increasingly, the discoverability is increasing. Yeah, that's right, they are. And, and they get sucked right up into Google Scholar and sometimes have, there's an issue that sometimes that doesn't, that on Google Scholar doesn't get by your your sort of published version, and that that that's a that's a bug that lots of people know about. But yes, they're they're easily discoverable. And Joel, you have a com quick comment or just quick question: Have you had experiences where reading the preprints have actually changed what you do in your lab? Because oh. you see something that came out, and you is uh, it is that with methods that people have used or results? That they yeah, have? it's a great question. Uh, so we have a we have something we're dealing with dealing with because it, 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 we're we're sort of partially scooped, and so we're in communication with that that team of, to talk about how do we how do we sort of slice this up? And they have priority. They 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 sort of established primacy on on some part of that that method, and, and it's at least accelerated the dialogue. I mean, there's sort of two ways to handle it. You could rush and try and beat them, but. That's not the spirit of it. Um, but no, we all we definitely see methods. There's a fabulous uh, method right now out for looking well for single cell analysis of yeast that's still caught in that morass of peer review at a big journal. But I have it on BioArchive and I'm in correspondence with the author to, to, to implement those methods in advance. Thank you. Should we address the question sure. at the end? Great. All right, uh, our next speaker is uh, Denise Kai, who's an assistant professor of neuroscience at the School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. <coughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you guys so much for inviting me to be a part of this exciting dialogue. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing about uh, our Miniscope project that uh, started at UCLA and it's continuing at UCLA. And we just, um, and then Tristan Schumann and I uh, just got back into positions at Mount Sinai and we just talked about is extending the Miniscope team to the East Coast. Um, so let me first start off by acknowledging the people and really talking about how this came to be. Um, so 
And when I started my postdoc, I was a postdoc with Elsino Silva at UCLA, and I really wanted to study how is it that our brains are able to code all of these different experiences across time. And we thought, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could peer into the brain and look at the neural activity rep that represents these different memories across time. And at that time, uh, there was a technology uh, of miniature microscopes that was just not accessible to us, we just couldn't afford it, it was too expensive. And um, we were celebrating in Pima Goshani's lab over some champagne, and there's a lot of good stories, start with some liquid courage. Um, and you know, after many bottles of champagne, Paymon said, well, why don't we just make the technology ourselves and share it with the world? And that was kind of the spirit that we continue to carry on through this project. So this project was really, um, founded by Pema Goshani, Alcina Silva, and Paul Cog, three um, faculty members at UCLA that came together and formed what I thought was a pretty brilliant team. Um, Daniel Aharoni, who was a physicist at the time studying dark matter, and we joked that we brought him into the light of neuroscience, um, in collaboration with Tristan Schumann, who is an electrophysiologist, so he's used to recording neural activity in um, live mouse brains. And then myself, um, I'm really a psychologist, and, um, you know, or I like to think I'm a mouse whisperer and can get mice to behave um, in interesting ways. So the three of us came together and worked together really well. And I really want to highlight kind of this very collaborative nature that we all bring in our different strengths and we complement our different strengths. And um, the way that we work together, um, we, Daniel would make the mini scopes. Tristan and I would break the mini scopes. And then together we would fix it iteratively over um, many bottles of scotch. So the goal of the whole thing was to be able to, um, <clears throat> so the goal of this whole thing was to be able to, as I said, peer into the brain of a mouse while the mouse is behaving, learning, interacting with the world, and look at the neural activity that represented these mental computations. So what you see here is um, uh, the very first version of what we call the miniscope, which is just a miniature microscope, which I'll get to in a bit. And what you see on the top right, so um, there is the neural activity, and this is the raw neural activity, and the way we're able to look at this neural activity is we um, infect cells with a, a genetic modifier, in which when the cells um, are active and they express uh, green fluorescence, in which we can then capture onto the cell camera, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail. We apply very simple math to align the frames and to pull out the signal, and here you see about 600 cells, boop, 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 um, uh, kind of encoding the memory of this novel experience. Okay, so um, this was, you know, what we uh, started out with. So actually a group in Stanford um, invented this whole thing, so we didn't even invent it. So uh, Mark Schnitzer's group at Stanford, what they did was they took a large tabletop microscope, what most of you guys are used to using, maybe in your high school biology classes or college classes, and what they essentially did was they took out all the non-essential components and only kept the important one, so threw that all away. And then um, they took all the control electronics and took it outside and miniaturized the imaging sensor, which is essentially that little uh, camera chip that's in your cell phones. Um, the light source, which is some just LEDs and some optics, right, some little uh, filters. And they miniaturized it and put it on the head of an animal. And so um, this was published in 2011 in Nature Methods, and um, then they formed a company called Scopics in which they commercialized it and now sell it to anyone who wants to spend $150,000 on um, this system. Um, but for many labs that are not HHMI or rich or you know, labs like ours, um, we just couldn't afford it. We thought this technology was just so transformative that we wanted access to it that we thought, okay, let's just develop our own version and really inspired by Open Fizz and Allen Institute, thought, wow, what if we open source this? And maybe, maybe 10 labs would want to um, use this. Okay, so I also just want to give a shout out. Um, we're not the only ones developing this miniaturized microscopes for open source platforms. Um, so uh, Sheena Jocelyn and Paul Franklin's lab in Canada, also uh, by archive and now published in uh, her biology protocols, um, as well as Tim Garner's lab has developed one for uh, miniature, that's miniaturized for songbirds, and, um, and Don Tin's lab at NIH has also developed mini scopes. So we're not the only ones out there, but I will talk about our project. So this is our UCLA mini scope, and we really like to think about this as kind of uh, two parts of the project. And so we think that there, we developed the entire system with all the hardware and associated um, software for the use. 
but we also um, spent a lot of time developing this resource. And I also just want to comment one thing about uh, what Josh was saying that you know it's kind of important to have something maintained and ready to put it out there. And we have. Um, we had to spend a lot of time thinking about at what point would we share it. Like, would we just share everything as we were going along? And we decided that um, we wanted people to be able to use it. And so um, we had a test. And so Pei Mongol Shan and Yelsino was like, why don't you guys recruit some high school students? If they can read through your tutorials and watch your YouTube videos, and if they can assemble this optical system by themselves, then it's ready to share it with the world. So that was kind of our uh, testing bar. So we didn't only use high school students, we also use undergraduates as well. They were all able to do it, so we thought this was um, at least ready uh, for the next step of sharing. So um, in addition to um, the, the head mounted <coughs> scope, um, we also um, designed data acquisition um, hardware, um, and what we just use USB 3.0, you plug it into the computer, the computer just reads this as a generic webcam, and so that way that it will hopefully be compatible with every Microsoft um, office upgrade that you'll ever have to do. And then um, you can also pair it with the behavioral cam, any kind of webcam out there. Our data acquisition software reads uh, webcams and time syncs the videos together so you can record both neural activity as well as the animal's behavior. Um, now what I think is um, the coolest part of the project is um, all of the resources are provided on a wiki backbone, miniscope.org. You do have to register um, to access uh, to access the website, but we basically accept everyone. Um, and so we think this is really aimed at at least two different types of users, right? So there's the end user, the people who just kind of want plug and play. And to be honest, it's not quite plug and play, you still have to assemble. But people who don't necessarily want to innovate and develop, they just want to take the system, ask your biological question, know what the answer is to the brain, okay? Then there are also developers who um, maybe like Josh or someone else with an engineering background or computer science background takes the source code or take the design files and they can innovate and modify and um, add all of these features and hopefully um, they also then uh, communicate those versions back to the uh, website and so this has become a really um, active sharing uh, discussion forum. And then there's everyone in between. Um, so we work very closely with our machinist who helps machine a lot of these products for our users. And he actually showed me a picture. Um, someone uh, was sitting at a coffee shop, drew a new design on a napkin, took a picture and sent it to the machinist and said, hey, can you modify the mini scope with these new features? I don't know how to use AutoCAD, but here's a picture on a napkin. And then our machinist did it. So, um, you know, we really try to work with the community so that people with all different levels of experiences, if you have a great idea, you know, we can connect you to the right people to help make your ideas come true. We try to help with that. Um, Okay, in addition to this, um, what we spend a lot of time doing is um, also um, giving hands-on workshops because we understand not everyone who reads our source code or tutorials will get it, and so we try to interact one-on-one -on -one with um, scientists from all over the world. So um, on our miniscope.org website, so we launched this website about two and a half years ago. Um, so we just hit uh, 3,000 wiki users. Uh, these uh, uh, it's a heat map of um, a registered users on the wiki, and um, we know of at least 400 labs that have bought the parts for miniscopes and have built it in their labs. And what's been really interesting is we only know the number of people by um, you know the discussion board, as well as our vendors will update us with how many labs are now buying the products. Or we don't sell any products, but are buying the parts to make the miniscopes. But what's really exciting is that sometimes on Twitter, someone will tweet at UCLA Miniscope team and they'll like, oh, using Miniscopes to blah, blah, blah. And we never knew that they were using Miniscopes and they never interact with us. And just by going on the wiki and downloading the tutorials and the part files and everything, they were able to completely do it without our help. Um, and so the price of this is also 1 one hundredth of the commercial price. Um, and so we think that this really reduces barriers for science. And um, so for example, uh, we were recently doing a workshop in New Zealand and they were saying, you know, you guys are lucky in the States because it only costs $150,000. $150,000 here in New Zealand costs $250,000 for the same product. And if you guys didn't come and teach us workshops, um, we would never have access to this kind of instrumentation. Um, so, so far uh, we've been uh, teaching these workshops for two and a uh, few more years. Um, 
And so we've had 12 hands-on workshops. We've kind of traveled the world and, and we decided, well, let's just take all barriers away. And wouldn't it be fun if we just raffled off free Miniscope systems at our workshop? So every year at SFN, we ask our vendors to donate parts um, so that we could assemble um, 10 systems. And for free, the workshop's are free, you come and you learn and hang out. And then we also just raffle away 10 systems. Um, Okay, so when you come to these workshops, thank you, um, what do you learn? You learn about how to assemble the entire system. Um, all of this information is available on our website, so I won't go over uh, that. Um, we also teach you how to test it, just on slides, not on living animals. Then we also teach you, which I think is the hardest part, is how to perform the surgeries so that you can implant this animal, the animal doesn't die, cells fire, and they behave. Um, and so all of these workshop resources are available. So if you can't make it to a workshop or you go to the workshop, you're inundated, you don't remember anything, you go home, you log on to the workshop, um, I'm sorry, you log on to the miniscope.org website and under workshop resources has all of the PowerPoints, including some of the ones I'm showing here today. So you can refresh your memory or go onto the discussion board. So one of the benefits um, about doing this kind of open source science, I said, and as Josh had mentioned, is not just that you have something plug and play, but that as scientists, we want to constantly hack into our system. I really like that term. Um, and modify and, and make it, you know, change it for our specific research questions. Um, and so for recently, for example, one of the changes that we made is to make it wire free. So we wanted to explore more naturalistic behaviors in which the animals were not tethered. So we developed a new wire free system or the no strings attached um, miniscope. And so now instead of powering it through the cable, we can power it with the lithium ion battery that we tether to the miniscope. And then um, instead of transmitting data through the cable, we just data log it onto a micro SD card. And this is um, out on BioArchive. Um, and uh, we're hoping to share the designs on miniscope.org. Um, we're, we're happy to share the de designs with anybody, but right now it's just getting the manpower to get it assembled in an organized fashion. So here's just an example of an animal wearing the um, no strings attached miniscope um, as it's exploring um, uh, social uh, cups. There's females underneath those cups, and then we can visualize the neural activity. Or here, we're having um, mice who want to learn spatial maps, running down a 25-foot long meter track, um, for example. Um, and I would just make one comment. I don't have time to talk about it all. Yes, wrap up. Okay, so I'll just say the hardest part of our um, where we're at now is what do we do with hundreds of thousands of cells, right? How do we how do we make that into meaningful information? And so a student of mine is trying to take a lot of published um, analysis um, out there, but um, creating an interface that is helpful for both people who are really great at coding and then biologists who never touched MATLAB um, and creating um, a Python package in between that is user friendly and that gives you lots of visualizations and intuitions about altering parameters does to your output of your data. And this is currently on GitHub. And this is summarizing what I just told you about our system, both the hardware system and the resources and to thank um, everyone that contributed, my collaborators and funding sources. Um, and again, uh, Daniel Aharoni, who's really the genius, the physicist behind all this, but we all work very closely together. And thank you so much for your attention. So that's a fantastic question. So um, this technology is actually patented by Stanford and licensed to Scopic, the company that commercialized it. But as research institutions, we have an implicit understanding with other research institutions that we can build it and for research purposes. Um, this is why we don't sell anything. We make zero dollars. All of this is, you know, volunteer and um, yeah. So as long as you do for research purposes. However, with that said, there are companies like LabMaker and there are other companies that have commercialized our version of the Miniscope and are selling either the components or complete systems. So there's a company in China, um, but you know, and, and LabMakers I think is a company in Germany. So th there are international rules that 
quote unquote, may or may not protect them from such a bridge. Yeah. How is, so that's wonderful that, that it really is open source and, and I think also that allowed, sorry, that you've allowed, um, or the, the, the original patent has uh, allowed for uh, commercialized sort of maybe a little bit more user-friendly yeah. prepackaged versions. Way more user-friendly. But it, you know, and it, so it's great for the community. I'm curious how you stay funded, right? So, so you just mentioned this amazing uh, story of somebody snap uh, sending them a, a picture of uh, something to be machined. Who's paying the machinist, and yeah. how does how does this how does this innovation and also just support for the for the community um, keep going? Yeah. So um, this original project was funded through um, some funding from the dean. So our dean said, here's a little bit of seed money, see if you can get something working. Um, and I think the open source spirit really caught on, and I really think we bought a lot of goodwill in the community. So um, so then when I was a postdoc at UCLA, we got a U01, was made a couple million dollars to um, really do the, not only develop the technology, but also share it. And then um, before I left, uh, it was another $10 million from NSF to really open source it that funds all of these workshops that we go on. Um, and so I think you know NIH is really trying to um, encourage open science and, I, and, and open sharing, data reproducibility. So all I didn't talk about, but a lot of our raw data is put online so people can download it and, and to take a look at the raw traces. So, um, I think there needs to be more funding sources and uh, more opportunities for this kind of um, open science development. Yeah. So our final speaker for this session uh, is Anisha Keshavan, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Learning and Brain Sciences at the University of Washington. Hi. Um, so the name of my talk is about going from the wet lab to the web lab. Uh, so I'm primarily interested in studying the brain. Uh, so here you can see a 3D reconstruction from an MRI image of the human brain. You can see this really unique folding, um, and we're really interested in how the shape of the brain relates to normal human development during adolescence, how it's related to mental health disorders, to general neurological disorders, and also how it changes as we age. And the thing is, we really need a lot of data because we're all so unique, we're all so special, and our geometry is all so different that we need to make sure we sample from a really large population. So we really are now moving towards collecting a lot, a lot of data. And it should be easy to scale up, right? To scale up our analyses to really accommodate these large data sets because, I mean, we have computers uh, and we have really like fancy algorithms. Uh, but the reality is that we're human. And so <laughs> this Lucy is, this is how I feel. It's my relationship with data because the machine is just like producing it and I can't, I can't keep up because I'm only human. Oops. Um, but the other thing is like humans, we have our strengths. So in this example, uh, it's a deep learning algorithm that's like 57% sure that the first panda image is a panda. You add a little bit of this like salt and pepper noise and now it's 100% sure it's a given. Um, and as humans, we would never make this kind of silly mistake. Um, and this is funny, but when you think about self-driving car technologies, um, here's an example where these kind of uh, vandalized stop signs are being read as 45 mile per hour. Uh, you know, speed limit signs, and then this right turn is read as a stop. So clearly we have our strengths, and I think that we really need to combine the strengths of algorithms with the strengths of humans. So algorithms, they're really fast, but sometimes they can be really stupid. Uh, and humans can be slow, but sometimes we can be smart. Um, so I really think that by designing the optimal interface, we can perform better science, especially for large data sets. And the thing is that design matters. So here's a book called The Design of Everyday Things, and here you see a really dysfunctional teapot. And the idea is that you know, we should be design designing machines that work for us rather than designing a machine and then us adapting to how it works. Um, and in science, uh, my hypothesis here is that open design really matters because if we work openly, we can overcome our limitations and we really can really optimize for our strengths. Um, so we're inherently slow, um, so we should design for collaboration. 
But we're smart in some ways, so we should really design for the human visual system. Um, and so I propose that the internet is our functional teapot. Um, so right now I'm studying pediatric mental health, and there's this really large data set being released from the Healthy Brain Network, where they're releasing 10,000 MRI scans of children aged 5 through 20. And this is a really important age for mental health because 80% of mental health diseases are diagnosed in this age range. And the main scientific question we're asking is, how do brain tissue volumes change during development? And this is really important because if you think about these normative growth curves for babies, we don't actually have normative growth curves for the brain yet. And so it's really important to understand normal variability in uh, brain structure and then understand how uh, individual differences in that variability are associated with mental health. Um, and the catch is that children move a lot in an MRI scanner, and this leads to a very bad quality image. So for those of you who haven't been in an MRI scanner, you need to sit still for five minutes to get a really good image. Um, so because this is inherently visual, we need to do visual inspection at every stage of the analysis. And this can get really unwieldy in the standard wet lab model, because asking your, the people around you to review 10,000 images is not a cool thing to do. So like a good millennial, I turned to the, I turned to the internet. Um, and I wrote this app called Mind Control. It stands for Brain Quality Control. Uh, and it's a collaborative interface to crowdsource the quality checking of these MRI images. And so you can go to mindcontrol-hbn, or Healthy Brain Network, .herokuapp.com. And here we have a little leaderboard so we can see that other scientists have actually started uh, visually inspecting these images. Uh, and you can open, for example, here's a bad image. Um, and you can see it takes a while to load because this is a good amount of data. Um, and what you're going to be asked to do is to click pass or fail and then rate your confidence score. So finally this brain image loads and you can scroll through it and you can look at every single slice, which is our normal procedure for this kind of thing. You can change the brightness and contrast and you can see there's kind of this like banding and there's this blurriness. So you can't actually tell the difference between the two main types of tissues in the brain, uh, the gray matter and white matter. And this is what we want to measure. So you can see from here we get a really bad measurement. Um, and so I got some expert feedback from my former mentor, Satra Ghosh, and he said, you know, mind control is nice, but it's slow. I want to play on my phone. And at first I was like, oh my god, I spent a year writing this, like, thanks a lot. Um, but the reality was that I wrote, you know, a dysfunctional teapot. Um, so I tried something new, I kind of iterated on the design, and I wrote something called Brainder. Officially, it stands for Brain Data Review. Uh, so I went on, tin, uh, on Twitter and I wrote, are you at work but feel like playing Tinder? Why not play Brainder instead and help neuroscientists rate the quality of brain images? Swipe left to fail bad quality images built with Vue.js and Firebase, hashtag citizen science. Uh, and I maybe had like 50 Twitter followers at the time and I'm very proud of this tweet because I think now it has over 400 retweets and over 600 likes. I mean, this went viral. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm proud. Uh, and the instructions are pretty simple. Um, if you see a bad quality image, you swipe left, as you would do on Tinder. Uh, and if you see a good quality image, you swipe right. Uh, and you could even win prizes, because you know I really had to commit 100% to this whole idea. Um, and so uh, depending on how many swipes you make, you could win you know, some mysterious monkey badge. <laughs> And this turned out to be really popular. We have someone who I don't know who was really, really like committed to winning that monkey badge and did 6,183 swipes. Um, and there are a lot of people who just helped out from the goodness of their hearts. We got so many ratings. Um, on average, each image was, image was viewed 20 times. Um, but often there was no agreement. Um, almost, you know, kind of like Tinder, people just started swiping right for everything. And I thought, you know, what have I done? I tried to solve a big data problem by collecting more data, and now I have to somehow fix it. So what you're seeing here is this kind of bimodal distribution of images that mostly pass. And uh, as this was updating in real time, this peak over here was like just slightly moving to the right, and I thought, this is bad, what have I done? Um, so we needed some way to downweight the raters, and this is where algorithms really helped us out. So we created this matrix of image IDs and raters, and we had this like expert rating that came from mind control. And each raider was a feature, and each image was a sample. And keep in mind, we had some missing data, because not everyone rated all of the images. Um, but we used this algorithm called XGBoost, which handled the missing data, and it's kind of based on uh, random forests. And it actually gave each raider their own importance score. And it did a great job at uh, kind of removing the people who did many, many swipes. And it said, OK, you weren't very important. So this was promising to us. 
And so the corrected rating distribution looked like how we would expect. And from there, we were able to feed these labels into a deep learning algorithm, which uh, basically gave us a really high accuracy score. The ROC curve was 0.99. Um, and so at this point in time, we have over 100,000 ratings, over 400 users, and near perfect accuracy from our classifier. So yes, I declare success, it's a functional teapot. Um, and so maybe some of you are wondering right now, well, this is great, but how do I build something like this of my own? Um, and thanks to some funding from eLife Innovation, um, we've created Swipes for Science, which is kind of this generalized template to create your own citizen science app. Um, you could use it for uh, classification of images, and so this is Brainderless, which is Brainder for lesions. A collaborator at USC um, has run various uh, stroke lesion segmentation algorithms on her data, but she doesn't know which algorithm is the best, so on Brainderless you can swipe right if you see a good quality tracing of a stroke lesion. We also have Whaleder. Uh, this is uh, Tinder for whales. So <laughs> um, oceanographers at the University of Washington really liked Brainder and they said, oh my gosh, we have sound recordings from the ocean and occasionally we can hear whales, but we don't have any sort of training data set to create an algorithm to automatically identify the whales. So I said, great, let's, let's do Whaleder. So I created a spectrogram of a five second sound clip and you can swipe right if you think you hear a whale or a dolphin or some sort of biological signal. You swipe left if you don't hear anything. Um, for text annotation, we have something called Abstract. Um, so this is an app to annotate abstracts. Um, I was trying to do some background research on autism and I wanted to know basically what are the sample sizes of autism neuroimaging studies throughout the years? Are they increasing? Are they decreasing? How big are they? Uh, and I realized that this is really hard to, to get because this information isn't the sort of metadata that's stored for scientific publications. Uh, so in Abstract, you see uh, a, a scientific abstract and you see all the numbers are highlighted and you simply tap on the numbers uh, and you submit that information to our database. Uh, and then right now I'm working on brain spot, which is uh, where you spot the region of the brain that has gone outside the segmentation borders. Um, and so it's basically an annotation of XY coordinates on an image. So if you have any data annotation needs, please come see me. <laughs> Um, but to go back to our scientific question, um, how do brain tissue volumes change during development? Um, and so I, I posted a preprint. Um, it's on BioArchive as a PDF, but it's also uh, in web form. Um, so if you scroll down, you can see this is all my text, um, and you can see that we have an interactive figure for figure four. Um, another random thing really quick is that I added a little unlock sign next to all of the citations that are open access and by clicking the unlock it takes you directly to the actual PDF like Wikipedia. I hate it when journals, you click on the author name and it takes you to the citation. Like that's useless, I just want to read the paper. Anyway, um, okay, so how do uh, gray matter volumes change during the ages of development from 5 to 20 years old? So here we see a scatter plot. On the x-axis we have age and on the y-axis we have gray matter volume. Uh, in terms of cubic millimeters, I'm gonna hurry up. Um, each point is uh, linked to an actual brain image, so when you filter the data by uh, its quality, you can see why certain images were left out of the analysis, so this kind of helps you with filtering your data in a fair way. Um, you can change how you uh, threshold your data by data quality, you can also change um, the metric that you're looking at, you can choose to split by sex, you can do a polynomial fit if you so want, and you can see this is really great for data exploration, but it's also a bad design in a way because I'm p-hacking in a way. So I also added a thing for number of comparisons. Um, so basically, it's a really fine line between a functional teapot and a dysfunctional teapot. On the one hand, this interface was great for ex exploratory data, but it was also terrible if you were actually using it uh, for p-hacking. Um, so to summarize, um, of course, open science is honorable. It's great that I got people involved. It's great that you know the data is open and the, the paper is open. But really, I think open science is strategic, especially in the age of data-driven discovery. I don't know how, as we start collecting more and more data sets, I don't know how we're going to review it visually. And we have to, to do good science. Um, so with that, I would like to thank my web lab. Uh, only four people on here are actually at the University of Washington with me. Everyone else uh, I've interacted with through Twitter or through Brainder. Um, and so I'm happy to take your questions.
just really amazing. We need to talk afterwards. <laughs> but we also uh, look at our brain development uh, in my lab. But um, so within that question, just very self-serving. Um, can you use this in other types of data beyond just brain structure, resting state, you know, like basic UPIs and so forth? Yeah, um, you can really, as long as you create a JPEG of whatever you want to annotate, you can add it to Swipes for Science. And, and what sort of expertise do you need? So, you know, the swipe left, swipe right could be, you know, It could mean else. anything, yeah. So yeah. right now, um, we've hired a user interface UX developer. Um, and so she's really working on prototyping the like optimal tutorial template. So you do need to write a tutorial for your users. Um, but the idea is that it would be um, presented in a way that is intuitive to people who aren't scientists. And, and it's primarily geared to identify uh, artifacts resulting from head motion? For Brainder, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Excellent work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that was really lovely, and I love the gamified component. But I'm curious uh, if you looked at how that might compare to, say, using MTurk to do like codifying or annotation for you in the same sort of setup, instead of like sending it out to the interested masses, just pay people a little bit of money to kind of do the same thing? Um, we haven't used MTurk yet. It's definitely something we're considering. Um, yeah, I kind of just I kind of just wrote this. I didn't quite expect it to be so catchy, to be honest. Um, I, I worry a little bit about MTurk because the the motivations are a little bit different, and also um, I want to make sure that I can pay my workers really well. I feel like there's a lot of um, instances where people aren't paid enough. So once I have the funding to to pay people at a fair wage, I think. Uh, I would definitely consider it, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. right. So if I could ask all of the panelists to come back up and select a bar stool. Um, we'll have um, 10, or 15, 10 or 15 minutes uh, to ask them all some questions. to start uh, and ask you guys a question. So um, in Rebecca's opening remarks, um, she talked about the future of science is this community working together and not individual scientists. And I think a lot of you touched on that. Um, and so I was hoping that we could go down the line and have you elaborate a little bit more about what you see as either specific opportunities or specific challenges to this new model of working in science. Um, or what we need to do to adapt our workflows or our standards as a community uh, and how we do that. So. Yeah, so um, yeah, I basically talked about this, about going to the web lab. I think um, the biggest challenge right now is that web technology is this ever-evolving field and it's really hard. I mean, you have to be a full-time, almost full-time web developer to really kind of build the interfaces that you would need to work with people on such a large scale. I'm really lucky in that my postdoc supports me learning this stuff, um, but I think it's a lot harder for other people. So that's why we're building Swipes for Science as a way to um, make it easier for people. Yeah, so I mean, I, I obviously pitched uh, the advantage of getting the literature out uh, as soon as possible through pre-printing, but I'd say one big challenge is that um, I think Folks are appreciating the opportunity of getting their the research out and having a you know a, you know a citable and version uh, record of their work out there, but they're not sort of embracing the, the open science um, value of a preprint. And if you you know, so I will go to a preprint and I will look for the data and look for uh, for the you know for the, the the raw material that would help me evaluate it and also compare it and use it. And it's maybe buried in a PDF and not actually something that you could say upload into uh, some data processing um, tool. Um, it may be hidden, it may say that the, the uh, say the, the raw sequencing reads in the, in, the, in the world of genomics are yet to be deposited and that's sort of against the, the spirit of the, of the approach and I'd say that, you know, 
ultimately we're going to have to make that a mandatory uh, uh, sort of co-submission for, for preprint records. Yeah, so in terms of community development in neuroscience, I think um, we are not, it's really difficult to take advantage of all the community development that is happening. Like within every lab, there are people that are developing code and building tools that they don't necessarily have the time to share. Uh, but if we had better platforms for people to uh, make those tools available, and especially people whose job was solely to take things that are built in the labs and are maybe not ready for, are not polished enough or documented enough to be widely shared, uh, but integrating those across lots of different labs and um, creating tools based on those contributions that can be shared more widely because I think we there's a huge amount of development that's happening inside every lab and very little of it actually gets shared. Um, I think a, a practical challenge that we think a lot about um, is how to get your postdocs or grad students the credit they need so that they can get tenure track jobs if that's what they want in the future. So for example, um, uh, when I was a postdoc at UCLA, the three of us worked really closely and we were all in because we believed in the science and believed in the project. And somehow, luckily, with one paper, the three of us all got tenure track positions, but that's not common. And it's really hard, I think, to convince three different postdocs, for example, from different fields to come together, work on a project, and share one paper because somebody still has to be first, co-first. So um, I think that has to do more with how we evaluate work in science and how we assign credit um, in, with journals and all of that. And I think our current way of doing it is quite archaic and it's not supporting this idea of collaborative science. And I think um, we are moving forward to changing it, but it's not quite yet. Yeah, you asked a lot of that. <laughs> all right. So I think uh, the big funding agencies should think seriously about contributing more in this domain. Um, I also think it's possible for labs to pool some of their funds to uh, create these resources or um, sort of centralized repositories where people can dump the, all the, the code that they've written and then people will take it and, and polish it and uh, make it more accessible to others. Um, I think if, yeah, given the amount of money that's currently being spent on closed source tools. Uh, we took a small fraction of that from each lab and pooled, pooled it. Um, then I think you could have a big impact, but of course, then it, somebody has to oversee that and make sure that uh, it doesn't end up going off track. So it, yeah, it, it would require a pretty big change in the, the culture, but I think practically it's not that difficult. I, I want to comment. I think, uh, so I'm fortunate to, to work with a program officer for one of our U grants who's really trying to, to uh, sort of patch that whole sort of in, insufficient um, uh, investment in, in teams and, and people to build tools that enable data sharing. But it happened after the fact. So the awards went out and everybody started generating all sorts of data. And they said, you need to share. And we're like, we're trying, but we can't. We can't, or at least we can't link the relevant data. So, so I think, uh, you know, what, I guess my broad advice is, you know, talk to your program officer a priori and encourage them that if you want to have the kind of success you want to have as a program, you might want to consider building this into the into the portfolio. You may wind up finding your if that's something that you want to do. You may wind up finding yourself a job along the way. All right. Yes, I wonder if you could comment on the role of your institutions because it's not just the money, right? It's about your. Um, such. I would love to take that one. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I would say I'm really really proud to be at Pitt. And, but the School of Medicine is a is a, is an is a is a big battleship that's that's trying to become more nimble here, and and so the processes of evaluation and the processes of hiring, um, of of developing the kinds of uh, uh, positions that that 
you know, maybe aren't a normal 10-year stream, or maybe they're an, a, a sort of a new model that, that is really uh, somebody who's going to be, you know, say a professional data parasite, right? But a data parasite that's going to be uh, sucking together all the good data that multiple labs are producing. Those, those kinds of institutional changes, you know, they're being talked about, but it takes a while for them to sort of trickle up to the point of where, um, you know, they're properly recognized and, and paid. I'd just like to comment on that, and I think that's really important. And um, so I've been at Mount Sinai for a year now, and part of our decision to go there was also because of the institutional support for open science, and particularly our project. And um, they knew that we wouldn't right away necessarily get NIH or NSF funding or you know federal funding, and so they um, supported us generously and through very creative resources to get us what we need to um, continue to do this open science kind of work. Um, so yeah, institutional support critical, especially at the early stages. Um, really great presentations. Thank you so much. A lot of food for thought. Um, I have kind of a crazy question. Uh, each one of you, um, in the space at a conference that I was yesterday about the Innovation Institute, where, you know, they really work with you to try to get funding so you can start your own company to develop your own project, and then the university makes money, you make money. And I just wonder, I mean, each one of you guys could have you know, gotten a patent and start making a lot of money. Uh, what, what, what's pulling you towards just being all giving? <laughs> what, 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 what are the, you know what I mean? How that comes to mind, I'm just really curious about that. So I was just in a job interview the other day, and um, I was showing another uh, thing I'm really passionate about is data visualization, especially um, for clinical data. Um, and I was at a hospital, and I was like, showing the chief data officer, and the first thing he said was, uh, you should start a company, blah, blah, blah. And um, my response was that I really wanted to be in a hospital setting. I wanted to be in an academic setting, because really, I'm kind of like the glue that brings people together. And without people around me, I, f I would feel like not as effective. Um, so I don't know if that was necessarily right, but I yeah, this is said to me a lot, um, especially when you're a web developer and the, the economy right now is like just, yeah. So I don't know <laughs> is the real answer, um, but vaguely it's that I wanna work with people and I really enjoy being effective when I work with people in academia. I mean, I'll just comment that, I, that I'm on both sides of that. Uh, so I'm working with a group from Innovation Institute on, on something, and, and I, I don't have a clean answer for you except to say that um, we're keen to share technology, particularly for education and basic research, as soon as possible. And if we, if we, and if we sort of figure out that it can be monetized, um, we, we, we do so a bit, a bit late, so maybe it's a, it's just sort of a lack of, of strate uh, strategy. We do have you know, something in the works, and um, ultimately we're trying to figure out what's the best way that we can um, get to where they are, which is uh, uh, sort of license the technology, but ultimately distribute it freely for those who, who need it free. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think science was always the number one priority, and um, I wanted to put in the extra effort to make the tools that I built to do science just, uh, more accessible to others, uh, kind of selfishly, so they would then contribute back and make the um, hardware and, and software better for me down the line. And it's definitely paid off. I mean, I, I'm still using Open EFIS on a daily basis at the Allen Institute. And um, because I made it so flexible and because there's been such uh, good community development effort, um, it, the software is much uh, more robust and usable than it would be if I had just kept it to myself. Um, and so I guess I, I never really had the motivation to start a company. I mean, we, we turned Open EFIS into a nonprofit so that we could have our own bank account and um, just be able to exchange funds and um, have some money to hire or support people. Uh, but turning it into a full fledged company, I think, was never, never the object. So I absolutely believe there's room for both commercialization and um, you know research for research sake, and um, I think uh, 
we had always had the idea, so we had a lot of people that said, you know, could you just turn Miniscope into a company so we could actually like get you to help us rather than just depend on discussion boards or whatever. And we used to even have Suck It Up Fridays because we just couldn't answer all the emails. And so then it was like every Friday we have one hour where we would just respond to all the emails and, and whatever didn't get responded in the hour, like just did. So um, because we were postdocs and we actually had produced papers in science um, aside from supporting this. Um, but I think our idea was always that um, we would continue to patent we, for the protection of, um, so that we can continue to disseminate open source but we could also have the option to commercialize it at a reasonable price such that labs could you know, then actually pay for the services because not everyone wants to figure things out themselves. And I think there's absolutely room for both. Um, as new faculty, just haven't had time to even you know, get things going in my own lab. So, um, but I think that's something certainly in our future that would go beyond many scopes, but just uh, no technology in general. I just, I just want to quickly comment. I think that that model that you guys have developed is remarkable, and it would be great if that model were more broadly shared because it's not. It's a, it's a model that I can say is still foreign to the the Innovation Institute at, at Pitt, which has transformed for the better a lot recently. But this sort of this sort of model of where you're actually going to you're going to you know protect it to some extent, and then you're going to give a lot of it away is is still a great deal of tension, particularly about the kind of credit that investigators would get for that model. We'll take one more. So it seems like the answers to the first couple of questions really sort of harken toward micro-publication, right? And the, the idea that, you know, you can publish, you know, a figure, a piece, short piece of software, something like that. Um, and we also talked about how it would be nice to have different funding models, you know, that would accommodate that, but we can want lots of things and not have them. So what I'm wondering is, do you have ideas about how to shunt micro-publications into the current sort of reward systems in terms of funding, tenure, that kind of thing? <laughs> so yeah, we're speechless because it's a terrific, it's a terrific challenge. So I, I can say that, um, my, my former and current institution look at that differently. And my former institution um, was moving to uh, consider those in a sort of as an addendum section in your vita on by the PNT committee, which I sat on. That is definitely not the case for the School of Medicine at Pitt yet. Um, but I think uh, the science is moving, I mean, as always, the science moves faster than the evaluation processes. Um, it's going to change when, when some of those, you know, so, so when some of us are actually on the other side. And, and I, I think, I mean, I'm really excited actually about, say, where our community here in Pittsburgh is moving to recognize that. But I mean, the formula, I would say that that discussion has not formally even happened. Do you want to ask? Yeah. Um, yeah, I had a question that's related to money again, and the question is more: um, There's already, you know, there's already a system in place where universities get IP for a discovery that gets patented and licensed. Um, when you apply for a grant to build an open system, how does do you have to actually say in the application that this is going to be open, and does your university have to sign off on it? Um. So for example, in some of the Miniscope grants that we've gotten, it's very specific exactly how we're going to be open, how many workshops, how many people are we going to teach this to, um, what we're going to put out there, when we're going to put it out there. And this is actually why uh, we bioarchive the wireless, um, because to wait for the time publications come through, and NSF is going to be like, nope, you guys did not meet your, you know, uh, what you said you were going to do. You did not make it accessible. Uh, to the community. So um, at least from our experience, we've had to be very, very explicit, and they come do checks, and, um, and we have to send very thorough reports of um, where we've gone to teach these workshops and how much we spent for each of you know, uh, the teaching components and the sharing components of it. Uh, I just want to say that early on in the open <laughs> process, we applied for a few grants to, to get funding, uh, both in the United States and Europe. And we explicitly said we were building an open source system. And one of the main criticisms was that this doesn't have to 
be open source. This is something a company can do. And so there wasn't that much interest in funding the open source project. And I, I think the, that sentiment is changing. Um, and I think we'll probably have more luck applying for grants in the future. But er, early on, maybe five years ago or so, um, there was, it was actually some um, the, um, feeling that open source wasn't that valuable. Um, so for my postdoc fellowship, I'm a year into my postdocs, so I'm still relatively new to this. Um, but my postdoc fellowship is really great because they encourage people who work with open science and who develop open source tools, so that's, that's been really great. Um, previously um, at UCSF, where I got my PhD, I just didn't really tell anyone that I was doing this, so. <laughs>